Here I am, send me. I pray that your prayer will be the same. Amen. And then the second of our short talks will be delivered by Esme Branagh. Happy Sabbath again. Okay, so in the book of Revelation, we are told that there is a specific action that needs to take place in the church just before Jesus comes. And it is a behavioral and mental health action. And I pray that we will come to understand the call that God has upon our life. Let's pray for a moment. Father, we thank you. We praise you as we open your word, as we share. I pray you would stand in my stead and teach in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So today we're looking at a little bit of science and a knowledge of science, as the spirit of prophecy tells us, of all kinds is power. And it is in the purpose of God that advanced science shall be taught in our schools, our churches also, as a preparation for the work that is to what? Precede the closing scenes of Earth's history. So I'm excited to be able to share this news with you. And this science has everything to do with your emotional and mental health. And the emotional and mental health that God's people in these last and final days must acquire. It is not an option. We must acquire. And this work God has enabled us to do through his power and his wonderful grace. So the word of God says here that <clears throat> thy word, David says, have I hid in my where? In my heart, so that what? That I might not sin against thee. Therefore, the word of God has power to cause us and prevent sin from prevailing in us. So it causes us not to sin. That's what the word of God can do. But the problem is, and what is the problem? We don't practice the behavior that causes us not to sin. So, what we do is, is pretend behaviors. You know, we all come to church on Sabbath, well, most of us do, and we say, Happy Sabbath. We look at our brothers and sisters, we smile, but some of them we don't really like. Well, listen, God is doing a thorough investigation of the heart now. And he wants us to be genuine Christians. Amen. Genuine Christians. That we are able to express the true love of God. You see, it all happened in the Garden of Eden. Where all the five senses were involved in sin. Eve heard the voice of the enemy. She moved closer. She touched. She smelled. She tasted. All five senses were engaged in the act of sin. When sin entered in, and this is the biology of sin, did you know sin had a biology? It sure does. When sin entered in through the process of what we call in neuroscience signal transduction, it's a big word, but it's a, it's a word that simply means this, that every environmental signal that addresses your five senses moves through receptors that are on every cell in your body and we're made up of like 50 trillion cells and over that's amazing so these signals come in mainly through your five senses and that's why we have been told to guard what the avenues of our soul you see that it's a beautiful science so these receptors open they receive the signal the signal then transmits into blood so when someone shouts at you, that transmits into blood. When someone gives you a glaring look, that transmits into blood. Everything we do, say, touch, taste, transmits to blood. Your food, whatever you're eating. And this is why God's last day people have been told to abstain from animal flesh. And if you're still eating animal flesh and you have been an Adventist for more than two minutes, you're in trouble. You're in trouble because you're transmitting the blood of an animal into your blood. And we don't want animal propensities in these last and final days. Can you say amen? amen. We need the blood of Jesus flowing amen. through our veins, amen? amen? All right now, I know it's a little hard to take, but God will help you as you process through on this. And so when it transmits into blood, it travels. It has to go into the blood so that it can get to where it needs to go. 
So these signals come in through the receptors, they transmit to blood, they go into the nucleus of the cell where action takes place, where your DNA is, where your identity is. So imagine when Sid par partook of, uh, of a life within E, it went to her DNA and started this very process here, signal transduction, entered into the bloodstream. The picture you're looking at now is a deeper look of the insides of a chromosome, which is where your identity is and where its behaviors are expressed. So what you're seeing here, right here, are behaviors that are suppressed. So the godliness in Eve suppressed when sin entered in, and now sin expressed. You see how the DNA opens? That's behavioral expression. Signal comes in, hits these little tails, these are the histone tails, they take the message of sin at that time and opened up the DNA and now DNA began to express a new behavior, changing and transmitting a new type of blood in Eve. Amazing. And then, of course, she shared that with her husband, Adam. Now we have some, we have mutant genes. We got to get rid of these mutant genes. How do we do that? We'll find out. So from Eve, from Adam, sin transmits, just like your parents who give you your, your DNA, your eyes, the color of your skin, and so forth, sin had that transmission also, down through the ages, hereditary from our foreparents, and now cultivated by our practices. And so we have to change our behavior. There's a big issue here, because God is coming for a church, what? Without a, say a church, without a what? Amen. So he's coming for a church without a spot or a wrinkle. That's a serious thing. So God wants to do some eradication, some mental health services for each one of us today. We lost our identity. And now God is saying, it's time for us to awaken as a church to find that lost identity, an identity that was once in Christ that we have lost through sin. Genesis chapter six, verse five, as God looked down during that time after sin, he saw that the thoughts of man was sinful and it was on a continuous basis. So our habitual mind, our habitual thinking is normally now sinful. So we came from the DNA of God and now we're expressing a new blood which has caused us to think and behave differently and in a sinful manner. Thoughts like, I'm not good enough, I'm not deserving, all of those thoughts come from distortions in our thinking and what sin has done. Sin affected our behaviors, it affected our thoughts and emotions. And that's why we continuously think evil. We have to be conscious uh, 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 alertness to what's going on in the mind. So the entrance of sin changed the composition of blood. Do you agree? Sin is a stressor and we live in stress every single day, don't we? Even getting the kids to school in the morning can be really stressful. Thinking about work, stressful. Driving on the highway, on the motorway, stressful. So sin is a stressor, and the first exposure was toward Eve. Stressors trigger the hypothalamus pituitary system, the HPA system, to produce cortisol, which is a chemical, and heightened ongoing levels of cortisol. That's the, that's the, um, the chemical that causes you to fight or flight. When a dog's coming, and suddenly your heart starts palpitating, and you either run from the dog, or you address that dog. And that's what cortisol does. But heightened levels of cortisol, when it remains and continues, that means stress is constantly coming in, therefore becomes toxic in the blood. It leads to disease of mind, mental health, and then into the body, arthritis, aches, pain, muscle, joints, all that feeling in your body that you suffer is often from stress. And so now it it eventually will lead to death. So sin caused, was a stressor, causing heightened cortisol, leading to death. So what does that tell us? 
the wages of sin, and the word of God is true, is death. Is death. We cannot turn that around. So what we are constantly thinking and behaving and doing fires together these wonderful structures in the brain, physical structures in the brain, are fired as you are thinking, you as you are behaving. If you keep having a, an emotion of depression and sadness, you are building strong structures in the brain for that behavior and that emotion. You, at that point, will begin to fail to hear the words of God because the more you fire and wire together, it lessens the voice of God depending on what you are firing and wiring together. So your thoughts have much to do, again, as I say, with your behavior, and that's what it looks like in your brain. Those are the, the, the neurons that are connecting and building those strong networks in your brain. Networks of anger, networks of resentment, networks of bitterness. Those are some of the networks we want to start trying to break down through the power of God. We have two powerful guidance systems in the mind. We have the conscious mind, we have the unconscious mind. And the Bible says that God says, I wish you would be of one mind for an unstable mind, a double-minded person is unstable in all his ways. So in the unconscious mind, there are many, many thoughts and memories and everything you've ever learned. Let's look at that. 5%, let's start with the conscious. 5% is all we use per day of the conscious mind. That's the alert mind, the logical mind, the creative mind, 5%. While the rest of the day is spent daydreaming, thinking back, waking up in the past, worrying, fretting, resisting, harboring thoughts, ruminating what she said and he said. 95% of the day, we gotta turn that around. Would you say amen? amen? These are some of the things in the unconscious mind. And as we look at the unconscious mind, we see that there, it is a resistant mind. It carries the doubts, the fears, the anger, the anxieties of the past. It carries some joy too, and the things you learned, the positive things of life are also there. It just has a huge capacity for memory from everything and anything you have learned. Your breathing, your digestion is there, um, um, your stress response, all those things that are automatic takes place in the unconscious mind. It is very protective and it is very suspicious and let me tell you, it does not like change. That's why some of our board meetings are difficult at times because people don't want change. We don't want change. And that's the unconscious mind ruling the day. So we want to turn that around. We want to turn that around. Few realize that it is a duty to exercise control over the thoughts and imaginations. It is difficult to keep the undisciplined mind fixed upon profitable subjects. It is hard. But if the thoughts are not properly employed, Religion cannot flourish in the soul. So we have a little work here to do, saints. We got some work here to do. Paul says, have no temptation taken you, but such as was common to man. But God is faithful who will suffer you to be tempted above, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you, you are able to. And with every temptation, God has made a way of escape. I believe that's what the cortisol is for, is for us to run from sin and temptation. But unfortunately, many a times we remain in that situation and receive those signals that change our behavior. Paul says, I find in a law that when I would do good, and I know we could all relate to this, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, he says, warring against the law of my mind bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. So here Paul verifies that the action of sin came through signal transduction and is upon the members. We all have sin laying deep within the nucleus of every cell of our body. We say, how are we gonna overcome, Lord? How are you gonna come for a church 
without a spot or a wrinkle. But Paul says, don't let sin rule in your body. Wow. So God must have a way of escape. Amen. I'm glad to hear that. Again, what fires together, wires together. It works for the positive things you're firing to. Isn't that a blessing? It works for those things you're, you're working on to change yourself as well. And so these beautiful tree-like structures are formed in the brain. You can have tree-like structures of evil, of continuous evil behavior in your thoughts, and you are constantly building them as you are thinking upon them. And here's why we are told in the spirit of prophecy that nine-tenths, nine-tenths, scientists today are saying 98%, they're a little higher now than what our, our messenger of the Lord had said, that nine-tenths of all disease, brothers and sisters, begin in the mind. Do you know many people die from their thoughts, from what they have produced, that toxicity in the body causing heart and brain disease, muscular atrophy, we think negative too much. And when we do that, we are poisoning our system. Do you know you frighten yourself by thinking dreadful thoughts? Just by a thought, you cause cortisol to rise, which is toxicity. Your very thoughts are killing you. And God wants his church to be renewed in the mind. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, brothers and sisters. It's time for God's people to wake up, listen and, and watch, and, and be alert to what you're thinking. Because the unconscious mind will do your thinking for you. It thinks when you're not thinking. While you're sleeping, it's thinking for you. So we have to be very careful now as God's people, especially those of us who will be alive at his soon coming. You believe he's coming soon? Yeah, yeah. Many of you who are willing and choose to be alive will see him. Some of you sitting right here in these pews, you can see him if you make that choice. So the habitual mind, the habitual thinking. The Bible says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So is he. For it is God which works in both to will and to do of his good pleasure. We have choice. Just as Adam and Eve had choice, they made a decision. Today, God is blessing us again with the same opportunity to make those decisions. But we have to surrender the will because we can't do the choosing, but we can choose to give him our will. Isn't that amazing? It is hard to come up out of a word, world of sin, but God says even though you are made up of over 50 trillion cells, we are just one big cell sitting in the petri dish of life where signals are coming in and bombarding us day after day through every sense, every cell. But God says if you keep yourself in my presence, in, in my atmosphere, you will receive the signals then of heaven. And can you imagine your, cell, your cells and DNA opening up and expressing heaven and Christ's personality? That's how you become formed in the image of God. Isn't that beautiful? A total transformation by your choice. You choose where you take this 50 trillion worth of cells. It's your choice, what you look at, what you taste, what you see, all of those negative thoughts right there, God says in his word, they are strongholds. They love to keep you captive. But Christ came to set the captives free. And he says, cast down those imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. And bring in every thought now, ladies and gentlemen, into captivity. That means be consciously aware of what you're thinking. Science says you have 10 minutes when a thought, an emotion comes to the frontal lobe, to the cognitive area for you to work on that. So if hate, anger, when you see that person, the bitterness inside, catch it. 10 minutes. If you don't, it goes back into the unconscious and continues to ruminate and destroy your life. It remains as a toxic poison. Catch it. Say, Lord, I got to love this person. Lord, help me to move beyond what she said, what he said, what he done. And I'm talking about the insults of life. 
I'm talking about the rape. I'm talking about the incest. I'm talking about those deep abuses that we tend to ruminate in our lives that destroy us. Even after the perpetrator is dead, we are still dying from what they did. We gotta rise. We gotta say enough. I will have the mind of Jesus. For he said, let this mind be in you, which is in Christ Jesus, and start to build those tree-like structures, the ones that are planted in the brain by the Lord, Isaiah 61, verse 3. And this is how you do it. You take the word of God, for the word of God is quick. It is powerful. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, hallelujah. It is a discerner of the thoughts, thank you Jesus. It even discerns the very intents of the heart. This is beautiful right here. This is the science right here. It gets to the marrow where blood cells are made in your body when you read the word, when you stay in his presence through prayer. Prayer keeps you in a cognitive and alert state and begins to heal the body. Oh, there's so much I can show you on the science of prayer. The word of God gets into the nucleus of the cell. It is a signal that comes in. It hits every part of you and it begins to revive you, cleanse you, purify you, transforms you as you sit in his presence. His law will be written upon the heart again. Sin will begin to shut down and then the law of God will begin to express and the law of God is coming into question as I'm speaking right now. Do you know that the Sunday laws are on the books? Are you aware of where we are in time? And the need for God's law to be established again in the heart? For us to awaken as a church is not church as usual. This is an unusual time we're living in. And it's time for God's people to make up their minds and have the law of God put back into their hearts. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. The laws governing the physical nature are as truly divine in their origin, origin and character as the law of the Ten Commandments. Man is fearfully and wonderfully made for Jehovah has inscribed his law by his mighty hand on every part of the human body. Praise God. The law is still there, but it needs to be agitated and opened again as you sit in the presence of God. You will begin to open more and more of Jesus and the law of God, his image will begin to express. It is a science, it is a proven science. It's the science of epigenetics. And this is a beautiful science that shows you that we can be perfected as we practice the behaviors. All that you have learned, Philippians 4 verse 9 says, now go and practice. Practice righteousness by faith. As you practice righteousness by faith, you will become righteous. Don't let anybody tell you that Jesus has done it for you because science proves them wrong. Jesus has not um, established in you holiness unless you choose for him to establish that holiness in you. Do you understand that? So you don't sit in your bed of sin. You rise up and you make choices so that you can create in you that clean heart that God has promised to do. You are a co-worker with God so that you can become a partaker of his nature. Co-worker, partaker. No co-worker, no partaker. You gotta work with the Savior, he's willing. So now the voice of God, the will of God will be made known to you for he will create that clean heart. He would not only do that, but the implanted word, when you meditate upon God's word, it builds even stronger structures in the brain. Those neurons get stronger, harder, and more enduring. The conscious mind is strengthened to govern the unconscious mind. As we focus upon the cross of Jesus and look it unto him, the author, the finisher of the work, we will be not like the unwise virgins, but we will be like the wise virgins. They all slept, yes, but listen, we are not the ones who slept. God's people are the ones who stay awake. They're in the conscious mind. They stay awake, why? Because they are the ones who eventually will give 
the loud cry. There was a third party in that story. That's who you are. You are the third party. You, you stay awake. Give the loud cry and God needs you to do that. And those who give the loud cry are those who will be healed and they will be sealed for the soon coming of Jesus. Are you ready, saints? Let's get to work. Let's watch what we're thinking. Stay in the presence. Receive the signals of God. Change your DNA and your gene expression. And let God take full control. Amen? Amen. Amen. God bless you.